Thank you, Eric and worship team, for a great morning of worship. Well, my junior year in college, I had to take a science class called Project Physics. It was designed for non-science majors who had to finish their science requirement uh, and get it out of the way. So all of us just called that class Bonehead Physics. So I was in Bonehead Physics, and uh, my roommate at the time was a guy named Mike. Uh, he was also stuck taking that class as well. We had to get it to graduate. So we sat together in the back of the lecture hall and just planned on passing that class with as little pain as possible. And one day, I remember, the professor was up there lecturing about astronomy or something, and he, he, he asked a question. He said, why is the sky dark at night? And Mike and I were like, duh. Sun goes down, we, we know that. That's why we're in bonehead physics. Professor went on to say that since the universe contains over 100 billion galaxies, each galaxy well over 100 million stars, some of which are much bigger than our sun, that therefore the night sky should be just filled with light. And that sounded completely crazy to me, but I'd never thought about it before, and so now I was kind of paying attention. And he said that part of the answer has to do with the fact that the universe was created at a finite point in time. Now that I agreed with. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, I'm on the same page as the professor. And then he said that since the universe exploded into existence at a finite point in time, it was still expanding. He said, the sky is dark at night because some of those stars are so far away from Earth and moving away from us so fast that the light waves have been stretched out that sh actually shifts the light coming from those stars to a part of the spectrum that's invisible to us. He called it the red shift. Now, I probably totally butchered the red shift, but that's how I remember it. Right at that point when he said that, my buddy Mike sitting right next to me dropped his pen on his notebook and said kind of to himself, I don't have to believe that. I don't have to believe that. He just couldn't wrap his mind around the mysteries of the universe even when they were being explained to him. And the truth is, there are lots of things that are mysterious to me. Like microwave ovens. How does that work? You put your coffee in there and the coffee gets hot, but the cup doesn't. How does that work? Somebody knows how that works, but I don't. Or GPS. Or Siri, the lady that lives in my phone. How does that work? Alexa, the lady that lives in your, in your kitchen. How does that work? I just treat all that stuff like magic, right? It's just magic. It's just a mystery to me. Now, today we're going to look at a different kind of mystery. We're in the fifth week of our series from the New Testament letter to the Ephesians, and it's called Built to Last. Remember, this was a letter, an ancient letter, written by the Apostle Paul in about 61 A.D., so close to 2,000 years ago, but written less than 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul is in a kind of uh, prison confinement in Rome, waiting for trial before Caesar, who at that time was the emperor Nero. Now, in the first couple of chapters, which you've already been through or you've been through in your book club groups, his focus has been to remind the Ephesians these young believers coming out of a pagan culture, and to remind us of the truth and power of the gospel. Chapter 1, he said, remember, you are chosen and adopted by God the Father. You've been redeemed or purchased by the Son, and you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And then he prays for them that God would give them the spirit of wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit, through whom they could know the glorious hope of heaven and the immeasurable power of Christ, who is above all. Then in chapter 2, he reminds them and us that they were dead in their sins, but God had made them alive, that they were separated from God and without hope, but God brought them near by the blood of Christ. And that now the Jews and Gentiles, these two very different people groups, have, are being built together into a new thing called the church. And that leads us to chapter 3, where we begin today. So I'm going to read the first 13 verses of chapter 3. We'll put them on the screens for you to follow along. Paul begins chapter 1, uh, verse 1, chapter 3. He says, For this reason, meaning because God has done this new thing, is building this new thing called the church, Jews and Gentiles together, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Now notice how Paul sees his situation. 
He's not a prisoner of the emperor Nero, even though he kind of was, but in his mind he's not. He's a prisoner of Christ. In other words, he's saying he's right where God wants him to be. Verse 2, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Paul here is talking about his unique calling. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. How he is to take the gospel of Christ to the whole Gentile or non-Jewish world. And that's, by the way, why he's in prison in the first place. How the mystery, this first time Paul's used that word, and we'll talk about it in a minute, was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made minister according to the gift of God's grace, which is given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the uncertainty riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you which is your glory. Okay. As we've seen each week going through this letter to the Ephesians, almost every sentence is just packed full of spiritual and theological truth. In fact, so much that it's hard to even know where to start unpacking this in a sermon. But what I notice here is that Paul uses the word mystery four times in these 13 verses. Now, we think of mystery as that which is hidden and we can't figure out, like me in bonehead physics, figuring out the red shift. Mystery. Like why curling is an Olympic sport. You know, just mystery. (laughs) By the way, if you love curling, I'm just kidding about that. Paul uses the word mysterion in Greek, and it carries a bit of a different meaning in that culture for Paul. It means that which is secret and hidden, but not that which is unknowable. That which can be known through revelation and can only be revealed from God himself. Notice he says in verse 3, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed, second time he used that word revealed, to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery of God, Paul says, has now been revealed. So the first, thing we see, we, the first thing we see is that the mystery is of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel. Uh, when our boys were uh, very young, part of our bedtime ritual was uh, story time. So sometimes we would read books to them. I mean, almost every night we would read books to them, like Good Night Moon. How many of you had that book in your house, Good Night Moon? Okay. I used to be able to quote it for years. Or maybe we read Guess How Much I Love You. Some of you have that one? Anybody? Now, after reading those books like several hundred that times, maybe several thousand times, um, I started to make up my own stories. I kind of got tired of those stories. I started making my own stories. And some of our favorites were um, the story of a scary monster that I actually named Gronk. It was way before the football player. This is like way long ago. That would try to get into our backyard by climbing over the back fence. And we would have to go get our baseball bats and hockey sticks and and defeat the monster. It was a little bit violent, but it was my story. (laughs) Then we had a story called The Last Cheerio, which was a story about breakfast cereal. How one Cheerio would jump off the spoon and fall down and roll out the house. and We'd chase it all over the neighborhood and come back and we'd have breakfast. Then there was the one called The Elephant in the Kitchen. A story where zoo animals uh, invaded our house at night and started looking for food. And there was an elephant in our in our kitchen, and we would go down and eventually make friends with the animals and give them snacks, and we'd go play soccer or or football in the backyard. So the stories would begin with something dangerous and scary, but eventually would resolve into something heroic and brave and maybe even good and fun. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul has outlined already the scary part, the dangerous part. He says, you were dead. 
It's bad news. You were, spiritually speaking, dead in your trespasses and sins. You were separated from Christ without hope in the world. Then he says, but God, but God has made you alive by his grace. God has brought you near. You who were far away brought you near through the blood of Christ. This is what Paul calls the mystery of God. Verse 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, I realize that when we read a verse like this, go ahead and leave it on the screen there for me. When we read a verse like this, we sort of, that's just kind of Bible language. It's sort of what we expect to find in the Bible. But this is, at that time, a bomb going off in ancient culture. This is a, a scandalous, explosive, revolutionary, and dangerous thing for Paul to say. It's why he's in prison in the first place. Okay? For centuries, the Jewish people thought of themselves as God's chosen race. They had God's law. They had the mark of circumcision. They had the prophets. And they considered everyone else, the Gentiles, which would be most of us here today, the non-Jewish people of the world, to be unclean before God, to be unacceptable, to be far from God, to be excluded from the covenant of promise. There was a great cultural and religious divide in the world between Jew and Gentile. Maybe the closest thing in our experience, in our culture, would be maybe the historic divisions between races in our culture, or maybe the political divide that's in our nation, or maybe even the difference between Judeo-Christian culture and Islamic Middle Eastern culture, for example. But it was a huge divide. Now, Paul is saying that the Gentiles are included in the gospel. And more than that, he says, they are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise. Now, in English, that's significant, but it doesn't read the same way it does in the ancient language in Greek. In Greek, this is a progression of three compound words, all beginning with the same prefix. And if you... If you could see it written, it stands out. Paul's doing it on purpose. Three words, all beginning with the same prefix and increasing in levels of intimacy. Okay, he says they are joint heirs, which means same inheritance. They're going to receive the same promise, the same glorious hope of salvation. Joint body, full members in the church. Now, Jew and Gentile in the same, same body. Okay, then he says joint partakers in the promise. Now that means they share fully in the relational fellowship of the church. I think he's thinking about the bread and cup of the communion table, the, the feast that the early believers shared to remember Christ. So Paul is emphasizing that in Christ, there's no more distinction between Jew and Gentile. Why? Because the blood of Christ has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility between people groups. Both Jew and Gentile have been moved from death to life. Both Jew and Gentile have received a new identity. They are no longer identified by their cultural, ethnic, economic, educational, racial backgrounds. No longer. They're identified by one thing and one thing only, that is by Christ. This is a new thing. It's explosive and revolutionary. It's the mystery of the gospel. Secondly, Paul moves to the ministry of the gospel. The ministry of the gospel. Years ago, uh, I traveled with a team from our church to visit a church in Russia. It was at that time we called them our sister church. I've told stories about this visit in the past. Uh, the church was called Transfiguration Baptist Church in a city called Samara, Russia. This is a picture of the front of the church. Uh, was then and still is one of the most influential uh, Protestant churches, gospel teaching churches in that whole region of Russia. The pastor was and still is a wonderful man named Viktor Ryaguzov. And that, on that visit, he invited me to preach at Transfiguration Baptist Church. Now, I was both excited and kind of nervous. I was excited because it was a unique opportunity to, to preach 
in Russia. I never imagined my whole life I would get to do that. But I was also nervous because I have to speak through a Russian interpreter who was going to do simultaneous translation, which is really a weird experience. And I just didn't know the people and the culture to know if the way I preach and express myself would, would, would work or not. And I wanted it to be helpful. Anyway, so I was nervous, but I prepared the best I could. And right before the service, Pastor Victor took me back um, into his office and into kind of a kind of a small meeting room, and I thought it was just maybe to go over the service and to uh, pray with me before we walked out and, and, and did the service. But when we walked into this small conference room, there was a table, and sitting around the table were 10 or 12 old Russian men in their 70s and 80s, maybe even older, uh, white hair, steely blue eyes, weathered features, and when I walked into the room, when Victor, Victor led me in the room, they all stood up. And he said, these are the elders of the church. And then he introduced each one of them to me. And here's how he did it. He said, Pastor Brian, this is Brother Boris. He was in prison for 20 years because he was a pastor. This is Brother Vladimir. He lost his business because he was a Christian. This is Brother Alexei. He went to the Gulag work camp for 25 years because he refused to renounce his faith in Christ. And he went around the whole table, and every single one of these men had suffered because of their faith in Christ. And the overwhelming thought in my mind and my heart was, Victor, you expect me to preach to them? I've never felt so unworthy in my whole life. In verse 7, Paul says, Of this gospel I was made minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul says, Of this gospel, this mystery, I was made Minister. Now, we think of the word minister in our culture as sort of a professional clergy person. A minister is a professional Christian. But the word translated minister is the Greek word diakonos. Literally, it means, and this is a funny meaning, it means to kick up dust by hurrying. Now, what does that mean? It means one who executes the commands of another to the best of his or her ability as quickly as possible. It carries the meaning of a waiter like a waiter in a restaurant or a servant. So to Paul, it meant to serve Christ by carrying out the mission he had assigned him. And that was to bring the gospel to the Gentile world. See, Paul believed he was not only saved, forgiven, transformed by the grace of God, he was also empowered and gifted by that same grace for a mission. Now, Paul will go on later in Ephesians and other places in the New Testament to teach that every single one of us who calls ourselves a Christian, who is a believer in Christ, has received from the Holy Spirit gifts by which we are to minister. Every single one of us. Not just me, not just the people who stand up here, but every single one of us to lead, to teach, to offer help, to have mercy, to pray, to give. And in this way, we are all ministers of the gospel. Now here at Chapel Street, we like to say it this way. We believe God wants you to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact where you are. Notice Paul says, this gift was given to me, though I am the least of all the saints. Now, Paul wrote most of the New Testament we have. Why does he say, I am the least of all the saints? Well, he's thinking about his own story. He was once Saul of Tarsus, enemy of Christ, enemy of the church, but he experienced the grace of Christ right where he was on the road to Damascus, and he was transformed. See, Paul never aspired to be an apostle of Christ. He didn't dream about that when he was a little boy. He didn't decide one day, well, this is the best career path for me to achieve success. He was chosen, transformed, gifted by the power of God. He says, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is Paul's personal life mission statement. Paul knew exactly who he was, why he was, and what he was to do. It's all right there, one sentence. I wonder if you've ever tried 
to write down the purpose of your existence in one sentence or two sentences. Be a great challenge. Try it sometime. This is it. To preach the, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. To preach means to proclaim the good news. That is the mystery of the gospel. To the Gentiles, the entire non-Jewish world, that's a huge assignment. The people have always considered themselves far from God. And to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now that word, un, the Greek word translated unsearchable, is a word that if you look up you know, 10 different translations of the Bible, there'll be five or six different translations of this word because it's a word that just defies simple translation into English. It means boundless, unfathomable, incalculable, infinite, inexhaustible. And by the way, I'm not a scientist, which you all can tell when I talk about science things, but I notice that every time, every year, every few months, I see another article and scientists have found something either bigger than they thought before, the universe is either bigger than they ever imagined it, or they find a particle smaller that they didn't think existed. It's either bigger than they've ever imagined or it's smaller than they ever imagined. Now what I think is creation itself is unsearchable because the creator himself is unsearchable. That's what I felt in that physics class so long ago. It's just too big. It's too much. I can't begin to wrap my mind around it. It's what I felt standing in front of those Russian elders years ago. It's too big. I can't do it. It's how I feel every time we open the book of Ephesians and you try to put it into words. It's just too big. That's how you might feel when I say you have been gifted by the grace of God as a minister of the gospel right where you are. That's what it says. The mystery of the gospel, the ministry of the gospel, and now the third thing Paul talks to us about here is the mission of the gospel. The mission of the gospel. Have you been following the story in the news lately of this guy named Elon Musk? Have you seen this story? I, I'm, just, I'm kind of a late arriver reading about this guy. Um, he's in the news a lot. He's a billionaire, entrepreneur, and inventor. Made some of his original money by inventing PayPal and then selling it. Most recently, he's the founder of this company called Tesla, which is pioneering electric vehicles. Um, and now he created a company called SpaceX. Have you seen that? SpaceX, uh, a privately funded space exploration company. One of his goals, he says, is to reduce the risk of human extinction by colonizing Mars. Okay? Now, I, I, again, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't have uh, the intelligence of Elon Musk, but personally, I think that's a colossal waste of money. There's no air on Mars. There's no dirt on Mars. But he's got a huge personal mission statement to reduce the risk of human extinction by colonizing Mars. Just last week, SpaceX launched a rocket, and you probably saw this, called the Falcon Heavy Rocket, the most powerful rocket launched since NASA's Saturn V rockets in the early 70s. The launch is interesting because several things. It's interesting because it's all privately funded, government's not involved, privately funded. That one launch cost $90 million. Okay? Secondly, because the rocket boosters are reusable. Did you see that? They came back to Earth and stood themselves up right on the launch pad. It's amazing. But thirdly, that rocket was carrying as payload a Tesla Roadster electronic car, complete with a mannequin driver and an inscription on the circuit board that says, I'm not making this up, said, made on Earth by humans. And then that car was jettisoned into space. Did you see that? They shot it into space, and it's going to be in orbit around the sun for a hundred million years. This is the picture of it. A hundred million years. So, what does Elon Musk want the vast universe to know? <laughs> that he made a cool electric car. <laughs> I guess if you can do it, right? Paul wants the universe to know something else. He's already explained to us the mystery of the gospel. Jews and Gentiles jammed together in this new thing called the church, that he's been sent to preach this mystery. And now he says in verse 9, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, listen, the manifold wisdom, and that word manifold means multicolored wisdom, 
It's a, it literally means multicolored, like a tapestry, like a kaleidoscope. To us, it would be like an LED screen with a million pixels and a million colors, all making sense in one beautiful image. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Now I want to call your attention to the phrase, through the church, the manifold, multicolored wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now I have to admit to you, I've never preached in this exact passage before, not this exact phrase. And it, when I read it, it kind of surprised me that it was there. And it confused me a little bit, so much so that I was tempted to skip right over it. Like, how am I going to explain that? I expected Paul to say, we might expect Paul to say right here, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the mystery of the gospel would be know, made known to the whole world and to all the people groups of the world. That would make sense, right? That's kind of what we expect him to say. But that's not what he says. He says the gospel is not just for Jews and Gentiles, not just for all the people groups of the world, but he says for the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. What? What's he talking about? If we go back to the first chapter of Ephesians, we read this. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That's talking about heavenly places as in with God in heaven where God dwells. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also the one to come. So Jesus is far above all other authorities and powers and dominions. Maybe Paul's thinking about the emperor. Maybe he's thinking about the, the goddess, the pagan goddess Artemis. Then later in Ephesians chapter 6, we read this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now here, Paul's clearly talking about the unseen spiritual realm, specifically the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Hmm. So what's he saying? I was wrestling with this, and then I remembered Jesus' conversation with his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. When he says to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And then Jesus said back, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay, so let's put it all together. I think Paul is telling the Ephesians and telling us that the gospel is much bigger than we think. That the church is, matters much more than we ever thought. I think he's saying there's a great spiritual battle going on, not only for the souls of every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth, but a great spiritual battle over every inch of the vast universe. Paul is saying that Jesus died and rose again, not just to make us better people, but to move us from death to life. Jesus died and rose again, not just to give us the glorious hope of eternal life that we can look for individually, but to create this new thing, this thing called the church, not just as a nice place to go on Sunday mornings, but as the visible, tangible evidence to worlds seen and unseen before the very forces of evil itself that in Christ God has turned death into life. That through Christ God has revealed his eternal mystery that through the church the whole universe is put on notice that Christ is above all. Do you see it? Way back in 2003 or so I was on another team that went to Turkey, one of our first teams to go to Turkey. We have um, lots of people we support, works we support in that part of the world. We had a chance to visit the ruins of the ancient city of Ephesus, what we're reading about right here. And on the last Sunday we were there, we visited the church, a small church in the city of Izmir, which is 30 or 40 miles north of the ancient ruins of Ephesus. Church built, uh, met on the second floor of a small, uh, like, office building, only about 75 or 100 people in the room. So, like, 
that section of people. That's all that were in this room, in this church in Turkey. But it was an unforgettable experience. Worship that day was led by a Swedish family, mom, dad, and three kids, I think. Swedish family led worship. They were singing in English with the words on the screens in Turkish. The pastor was a German man who preached in Turkish, translated by an Iranian woman into English so we could understand it. The congregation was made up of Turks who were Muslim background believers, uh, Christian workers from Mexico, Bolivia, South Korea, South Africa, Australia, and a smattering us from America. And I remember thinking, right in the middle of worship, this should not work. There's nothing about this that should work. All the languages are mixed up. All the cultures are mixed up. There are people in this room that without Jesus would have nothing to do with each other. In fact, would hate each other. And there we were, fellow heirs, members of the same body, joint partakers in the promise. And all heaven rejoices, and all of hell itself trembles at the manifold, multicolored wisdom and mystery of God. This is what Paul's talking about. The church is the agent of God in the ultimate reconciliation of the universe itself. Now, Paul closes with this thought. He says, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory, he says. How can he say that? Paul is in prison. He's waiting for a meeting with the emperor Nero, who was crazy, who burned Christians alive for fun, who would eventually take Paul's life by executing him about six years later. How can he say this? Because the gospel tells him who he is. Because the gospel tells him why he is. Because Christ is above all. Because to Paul, the church was worth it. And why was the church worth it? Because God wants the whole universe to know. Not that we can shoot cool cars into space but that God is doing a new thing, creating a community of people identified no longer by race, culture, skin color, but by Christ, who is above all, who is in us by his spirit and who works through us by his grace. I hope you keep reading Ephesians chapter 3 because Paul's just getting started. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you today for your word. This ancient letter written to ancient people, but it speaks to us even today. Thank you for moving us from death to life through your blood, for inviting us into this multicolored tapestry called the church. And through us, may you make the mystery of the gospel and the power of your grace known to worlds both seen and unseen. In your name we pray. Amen. Even out of benediction, may we go now in the powerful name of Jesus, who is even now building his church so that the gates of hell itself will not prevail against it. Amen. Have a great day.